Uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. I know many of you have come to uh, hear the message that I'm about to preach, and uh, I'm, I've looked forward to this. I've been looking forward to this for several weeks now, and uh, we're going to look at Bible pro prophecy. Ezekiel 38, our world was thrown into turmoil when Russia invaded Ukraine, the nation of Ukraine, on February 24th. Why would Russia do this? And, of course, what is their end game? But this was completely in line with the nature of the, the, the leader of Russia, Vladimir Putin. His character, this is not out of character, his outlook on life. I have a quote we're going to put up here. Vladimir Putin said these words, a bear will not ask anyone for permission. Because this is how he views life, and you know that Russia is, uh, is uh, uh, typified. America is the eagle. Russia is the bear. The text that we're about to read is a very famous passage in the Bible. It's puzzling, but it is very famous. It talks about a battle... 2,500 years ago, God revealed this to the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel sees more than 2,500 years in the future of a coming attack on Israel by a leader who will bring a coalition of nations to attack the nation of Israel. We're going to uh, look at this. This nation is the nation of Russia primarily, and uh, they're going to lead this attack. What we're going to see, what I'm going to preach, is that God, more than 2,500 years ago, prophesied that Russia would rise, that Russia would attack, and Russia would fall. And I want to preach a message I've entitled The Rise and fall of the bear. We're going to skip through Ezekiel 38. Starting at verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now it tells who's going to be with him. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. You will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass uh, uh, that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I'll go up against a land of unwalled villages. I'll go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited against a people, gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba, Didam, and the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you'll come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company, a mighty army. You'll come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days I'll bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. The rise and the fall of the bear. Let's begin. Let's talk about the rise of the bear. The scripture that we just read is a prophecy. And prophecy 
simply means knowledge in advance. Over 2,500 years ago, God told us what would happen. And the reason why he can tell things before they happen uh, is because God knows things. He has perfect knowledge, past, present, even future. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, I am God, there is no other. I'm God, there's none like me. And now he shows why there's no one like him. He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God, knowing everything, he can tell the future. That's what this scripture is, knowledge in advance. And in this text, Ezekiel is prophesying through God that a military and a political leader will lead a coalition of nations to attack Israel. Verse 9, you will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops, and many peoples with you. A coalition not just one nation or one army, but a gathering of nations and armies. And our text reveals that the leader of the coalition will be someone named Gog of the land of Magog. Gog is not a person's name. Gog is a title. It would be like saying prince, leader, ruler, czar. It's a title. So this man who is the prince or the leader of Magog, it, it says. Magog is listed in the Bible, is one of the sons in Genesis. He is one of the sons of uh, uh, Japheth or the descendants of Japheth, Moses' son. And in history, Japheth has been identified with the Scythians and the Scythians, the Russians, uh, uh, identify proudly. They have a museum that shows this is their roots. Uh, they were originally the Scythians, which were a warlike people based in what is now southern Russia. Verse 2, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, the Rosh were people living, in north, uh, living north of the Black Sea, northeast of the Black Sea, and of course, this is talking about Russia. One other identifier, verse 6, says you'll come from the far north. In the Bible, the Bible says, according to God, how he views the world, Jerusalem is the center of the world. Actually, the, the, the word there is translated navel. So God is looking. How do we know who these people are? He says they are from the far north from what from Jerusalem if you look at a map and you draw a line above uh, Israel you'll have Lebanon and different ones but if you go to the far north up at the top you will discover this is the land of Russia today this is amazing this text because Ezekiel is prophesying about people he probably didn't even know they existed at that time, and they definitely were not even a nation at that time. So talking about people who aren't even a nation, Ezekiel is revealing these people will be so powerful as to lead a multinational coalition to attack Israel. Ezekiel 38 is following Ezekiel 37 strangely enough I don't know that was I don't know if you picked up on my wisdom there but the reason why that's important is that Ezekiel 37 is the vision of the valley of dry bones it actually is a prophecy of the nation of Israel that had been judged and scattered throughout the earth it did not exist as a nation Ezekiel 37 talks about the bones coming together forming an army and it is the reviving of the Jewish people coming into the land and that happened of course in 19 48. So now look at this. Ezekiel is looking ahead. 
His nation did not exist as a nation anymore. He was writing this in exile. Secondly, he's writing about people that their nation did not exist. And he, looking with the wisdom that only God knows, says, Israel will be a nation again, and there will be these people from the far north that they will lead an attack upon this. So the question is, how could a nation become so powerful that according to this text, no one in the world will be able or even try to stop them. So let's look at the rise of the bear for a moment. How did Russia, the bear, get so powerful or will be so powerful as to be able to lead this attack? I think, first of all, the rise of the bear begins with their desire for expansion. As I told you, they are descendants of Japheth. Japheth literally means expansion. We know this, that when they became a nation, they became a world power, expanded this into the Russian Empire under Peter the Great in 1682, and then in modern history, out of the aftermath of World War II, Russia built an empire on the ruins of Eastern Europe. This was the Soviet Socialist uh, uh, Republic. And so they had this desire to expand. That's what the Cold War was all about, is trying to stop their desire to expand. But then that empire was lost when the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991. And Russia, when the, the Berlin Wall fell and the, and the uh, uh, Soviet Union dissolved, Russia became the wounded bear, but their desire for expansion has not gone away. Look at this quote. In 2005, Vladimir Putin, referring to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, he said the demise of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitically, uh, geopolitical catastrophe of the century. This is what, how he viewed the fall of, of communism, the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union breaking up. He's not happy about that. Next quote, Ukrainian foreign minister Pablo Klimkin says, reversing the breakup of the Soviet Union and restoring the Russian Empire have now become an obsession for the Kremlin. They did not give up on their desire for expansion. This is something that is built into their political and military and national identity. Alexei Mitrofanov, he's a, a Russian politician. He said, Russia must control five countries in order to have quiet borders. Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, and Turkey. Vladimir Zhirinovsky, another politician. He wants, his dream is to rebuild the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine, Byzantine Empire would include Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and Israel. So these are powerful politicians, not only Vladimir Putin, but many of the, the rulers and the politicians, their desire is we want to expand our power in the earth. The second part of the rise of the bear simply has to do with the economics of energy. In the world in which we live, energy gives you money which gives you power. Some of you might not be old enough to understand this term. Out of World War II, when Russia seized much of uh, uh, Eastern Europe, we had what was called the Cold War. The USA, we were in a state of war. There was no shooting necessarily, but there was a fight and a competition over who was going to win the U United States won the Cold War basically because we bankrupted Russia. They could not afford. They built, put money into the military. We put money in the military. But our economy could sustain it. Russia could not. Basically, they lost the Cold War because they couldn't afford it. But that changed 
over the last 29 years because Russia discovered huge deposits of oil and natural gas. Russia right now is the third largest oil producer in the world. Russia supplies 27% of all of the oil that Europe uh, uh, needs. Russia supplies 40% of the natural gas to Europe. One politician, he said, whatever is driving Putin, his war machine is fueled by oil and gas. Listen, oil and gas not only gives money, it is all about power. Russia has power because they supply so much oil and gas to uh, Europe. Here is the implicit threat. If you go against us, we will shut off your oil and, and, uh, and natural gas. You ever wonder this? Why did Russia attack in winter? Anybody know history? You remember Napoleon, Hitler? The downfall of their empire was they attacked Russia in the winter. It's stinking cold. Foolish time to attack. But Russia deliberately attacked Ukraine in the winter. You know why? Because in the winter, when, when Europe is dependent on Russian natural gas to keep warm, here is the threat. If you get involved, we will cut you off. So Russia has risen because of energy. And this is part of the motivation for the invasions. They have invaded. They invaded Georgia, the nation of Georgia. And uh, part of this was the oil pipeline that went to, to Europe from Georgia. Ukraine has a massive network of gas pipelines that go to Europe. And so part of the rise of Russia, it is all about energy because energy gives you power. The third part of the rise of the bear, from our text, it speaks about what is primarily a Muslim alliance. Ezekiel lists the nations, not only identifying Russia, but lists the other nations that are going to join Russia in the attack on Israel. Let's, let's look at these. We'll go through these quickly. Rosh, the Bible uh, uh, identifies, which I said, of course, uh, from the 6th century, this is a group of people living in the southern Russia. They were called the Rash, the Reshu, the Ross. This is where we get the term Russia from. They, of course, will lead this. Gog, the leader, will bring these people. The land of Magog. The land of Magog, if you look on this, Magog is what we would say now as the stands. It is... These are former Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and even perhaps Afghanistan. That is all in the area identified there as Magog. Meshach and Tubal. This is part of modern Turkey, Persia. You know, if you meet an Iranian today, they will tell you I am Persian. They don't say Iranian. Persia is today modern Iran. Then it speaks about Ethiopia, which is now to us, that's one nation. Ancient Ethiopia was, uh, it, it encompassed more than just what is now uh, uh, Ethiopia. It was the land south of Egypt. It would be the modern country of Sudan. That's primarily what it's talking about. Put is Libya and perhaps a little bit wider, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, and then Gomer, Gomer and Togarma are both part of modern Turkey. Verse 9, the prophet added that the nation will have many peoples on its side, but here are the main players. It is Russia, it is the stands, it is Iran, it is Turkey, it is Sudan, it is Libya. What is it that all of these nations have in common? It is their hatred of Israel and the Jews. Here is Russia. They have a long history of anti-Semitism, 
of anti-Jewish riots. These were called pogroms. In there, there should be a picture there, in the pogroms, there, they killed more than 250,000 Jews just in these anti-Jewish riots. Here's a quote from Alexei Mitrofanov. He is the number two in the LP, uh, LPDR, a large political party. He says, I know people in the Russian military, very nationalistic people, they have ideas that the Jewish people have ruined Russia and they have an idea to attack Israel. It's interesting that the Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, he is Jewish. And perhaps this adds to the animosity because Russia has a history of anti-Semitism or being against Jewish people. All of these allied nations, I want you to notice there, they are all Islamic nations. Every single one of them outside of Russia, and Russia does have some Islamic people, but all of the other nations, they all are Islamic. They all want to see the nation of Israel destroyed. We have Iran. Iran, uh, in their, uh, uh, they regularly call uh, for death to Israel. They regularly call for revenge uh, against uh, uh, Israel. They, they are demanding that Israel be pushed uh, into the sea. They put huge amounts of money financing terror organizations like Hezbollah and other nations that are proxies uh, to attack Israel for them. Then we have Turkey. Turkish President Erdogan, he spoke these words, conquest is Mecca, conquest is Saladin, that's a former uh, uh, Muslim conqueror, it is to hoist the Islamic flag over Jerusalem again. This is what he wants, this man has spoken, and uh, what he is wanting is Jerusalem must be claimed for Islam. Sudan, the Sudanese government invited Osama bin Laden to Sudan and, and became a safe haven for jihadists. Osama bin Laden lived in Sudan and was protected there from 1991 to 1996. So think about how smart God is. Remember, we're talking more than 2,500 years ago, a nation that doesn't exist, and he says, how part of how will he have power with these people is that our text says, verse 7, you will be a guard for them, or some translations say, you will arm them. Think about that. 2,500 years ago, God said this nation from the far north, this coalition will be nations that they supply arms to. We have, uh, here's some quotes, uh, headlines. Uh, Iran and Russia are negotiating a $10 billion arms deal. Another uh, headline, U.S. again accuses Russia of sending arms and mercenaries to Libya. That's put, which is listed in our text. Here's another headline, Turkey's arms deal with Russia is an affront to NATO. So God, knowing that he would arm them, which would, of course, cause them to want to join, and then their common vision of this coalition is to work together to destroy Israel. Look at this quote. Colonel Pavel Chernov of the FSB uh, believes Russia should say to the Muslim world, we have the power, the land, and the nuclear weapons you have one billion people living bombs. Let's work together to destroy Israel. And God knew 2,500 years ago that that spirit would be in the Russian people and that they would be joined together with these Islamic nations. The fourth part of how could this nation get to the point of being able to attack successfully the nation of Israel has to do with the weakness of other nations. Verse 13 says, when they come to attack, what will the other nations in the world do? Will they supply arms? Will they help? Will they send troops? Absolutely not. Verse 13, 
they will protest. They will say, hey, that's not nice. But they will do nothing. Does that sound like anything you've been reading in the paper? Part of Vladimir Putin attacking the Ukraine, he wants to control the Ukraine, but more than that, he is deliberately trying to expose the weakness of the West. For years, there is this competition. Other nations, are they going to lean toward the Western nations, the United States and Europe, or will they lean toward Russia? What Vladimir Putin wants to do is show the other nations the West is weak. You better not put your trust in them. We know that last year, what was it, September, October, whatever it was, the USA pulled out of Afghanistan. We showed our weakness. We pulled our troops and gave it back to the Taliban. That has emboldened Russia. The Ukraine was applying, they were applying to join NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is a mutual defense pact. If one nation is attacked, Article 5 of, of uh, the NATO is, we will help you, we will fight and protect you. But what we have seen since February 24 is we see the weakness of the West. The West is not doing anything to help in the fighting, essentially. Here's uh, uh, some headlines explain why NATO isn't sending troops to Ukraine. Another headline, Stoltenberg, NATO will not enforce a no-fly zone in Ukraine. So here is NATO, which is supposed to be a defense pact. They will not help. Remember what we said in point two? Because Russia says, we'll cut off your oil and gas. It's winter time. Your people will freeze to death if you get involved. And has shown them to be weak. We see that what's the strategy of Biden and uh, the Western nations? Sanctions. But what they're not telling you is in every sanction that they levy, there are loopholes. Initially, they said they remove banks from the SWIFT uh, uh, banking organization that enables uh, banks to communicate and send money, but not all banks were included. That sounded good when they announced, we're, we're taking them out of SWIFT, but they didn't take all the Russian banks out of SWIFT, just some. The ones that were already under sanction, those were removed from SWIFT, but the others, they let them go and they let them continue to trade. Initially, when the, the oil, they were going to, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, they were still buying Russian oil initially, and some of that has changed a little bit. And then in verse 13, protest without help. We know that Poland offered to help. The Ukrainian Air Force, they have learned to fly on MiGs. Many of their MiG jets have been destroyed. Poland had, what, 39 MiGs, and they said, we will give them to you. America stepped in and said, absolutely not. Do not give them MiGs. Why? Because Biden says, we do not want to start World War III. So he has already said our opening position is, we don't want to go to war. The weakness. And part of what that does is there are other nations hanging in the balance. Do they go with the West or do they go with Russia? Remember, it was Bill Clinton who signed that treaty and said, absolute, we stand with you, but we're not. And so now the world sees the West is weak, which further strengthens Russia's hand. Let's talk secondly about the fall of the bear. In our text, it tells us the motivations for the invasion. And hatred for Israel, of course, is the underlying motivation. Financial plunder. Verse 13, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, carry away silver and gold? Israel has discovered oil in the Golan Heights. 
Here's a quote or a headline, Israel finds oil reserve in the uh, Golan Heights. Many experts believe that Israel has a volume of undiscovered shale oil equivalent to what Saudi Arabia has, natural gas. Israel has discovered just two natural gas sources right now comprising 24 trillion cubic feet. Here's some headlines. Chevron CEO says natural gas pipeline from Israel to Europe could alleviate the shortage. Israel to boost gas supply to Egypt by up to 50% this month. That was just a few days ago. Israel approves a new route for gas exports to Egypt via Jordan. So what's happening, Russia is attacking. Europe is saying, hey, we're in danger. <coughs> if most of our natural gas and oil come from Russia, we're in danger. We need another source. Who has readily available natural gas? It's Israel. And now already is making plans to ship that to Europe which Vladimir Putin is not going to tolerate. Think about that. It says plunder. If Russia already supplies 40% of Europe's natural gas, if Israel has discovered 24 trillion cubic feet, why would you attack this little piece of land? Because if Russia controlled Israel's natural gas, added to their own, they would be the single largest supplier of natural gas in the world. Remember what I said? Energy is power. But our text says the real reason why this attack will come is not just because of their greed, their desire for expansion, it's because of the purposes of God. The Bible says that God is going to draw these nations to, to Israel in order to be judged. Verse 4, I will turn you around, I'll put hooks in your jaws. These nations have their motives for wanting to attack, but it is actually God using their motives because he wants these nations judged. The judgment on Russia and the predominantly Muslim nations is because of their hatred for Israel and their attack on God's people and God's land. Genesis 12, 3, I'll curse those who curse you. Zechariah 2, 8, he who touches you, talking about Israel, touches the apple of his eye. And the Bible says this is not going to be a standard military campaign overwhelming multinational coalition they come to attack but the bible says this is not going to be israel fighting these troops god says i'm going to fight ezekiel 38 18 when gog inv invades the land of israel says the sovereign lord my fury will rise we don't have to, time to read all the things there he speaks about a sudden great earthquake sudden diseases and hailstones mixed with fire that will fall on these troops and then god says the armies will start fighting and killing one another and so here god says and many scholars believe these people are brought to be judged and die on the mountains of Israel, but many scholars say that the judgment will not just be on those troops there, that at the same time it's happening to them in the mountains of Israel, the same judgment will be falling upon the home nation that the armies came from. Ezekiel 39, 2, I'll turn you back, and I will leave but the sixth part of you I will only leave one sixth of you will still be alive at the end of this battle only 16 percent of all these armies will survive and many scholars as I said they believe that's not just going to happen here there will only be when the judgment falls on their home nation there will only be 16 percent of the people in each nation left. If you do the math for Russia, that means there would only be 23 million people left out of the currently 144 million people in Russia. That is hard to even get our head around. So God says, 
I am going to judge those that hate Israel, all of these nations. It's interesting. Russia, I talked about their pogroms, and then, of course, supporting uh, the uh, anti-Semitism. Iran, ever since the Mongols took over in uh, uh, Iran, they have a long history of hatred for the Jews and, and uh, have done terrible things to the Jews. You'll notice four of the names that we read there are modern Turkey. You understand the history. It was when the Muslims took over what is now Israel. You understand the terrible things that were done. So God says, I am going to judge those nations that hate Israel. The final part of this is... In this battle, God is going to reorder the world. The Bible says, in the last days, there will be a world ruler. It's not going to be Vladimir Putin. The world leader will be what we call the Antichrist, and he will be European. His power base will be a European coalition of 10 European nations and he will have a European military. All right, think about that right now. Think about how far-fetched that would be that the Antichrist is going to lead from Europe. Think about the, the weakness of Europe right now. When you factor in how powerful Russia is, how powerful China is, how dominant the United States, but God says, I'm telling you, Europe is where the whole world is going to be run from. So how could that possibly be, but if Russia were destroyed? If the intense Muslim nations were destroyed, that would make a way for Europe to rise to power. Of course, the big question when people understand there will be a battle, this battle of Magog, the question is when? There are thoughts, is this the same battle that's listed uh, later on? Is that Armageddon? No, it is not. I'm not going to explain every detail of that. The big question people want to know is, is this battle going to take place before the rapture or will it take place during the tribulation? I'm going to give you my opinion. The battle is definite. It's going to happen. There are people try to understand, is this before or during? In my opinion, the battle that we just read about will occur before the rapture, perhaps simultaneous with the rapture, but I believe it will be before the rapture because the tribulation period is the power is centralized in Europe and... When the Muslim threats, if you take out the Shiite nations and the heavy Muslim hatred and opposition, the Bible says Israel is going to sign a peace treaty with this European leader. When you wipe out all those heavy Muslim nations, it's much more understandable why they would be willing to sign a peace treaty. I want to look at one final thought. I want to talk about God on the throne. The prophecy of Russia shows the wisdom of God. We read about this. 2,500 years ago, God could prophesy about people that weren't even a nation. Could talk about a coalition that wouldn't even make sense. But you know what that shows us? God, if he knows everything in advance, God is in control at all times. God is on the throne. He rules at all times. It is incorrect to think, dear Lord, Vladimir Putin is wrecking everything. He's put in travel restrictions. We now have Russian pastors. I don't know when Sergei Golubev or other Russian pastors will be able to leave Russia again. Right now, they cannot leave no preachers are allowed to go into Russia. I was supposed to be there in May. That's not going to happen. But the Bible says everything that happens is God allowing it to further his will. 
You see, God is going to use Russian aggression to work his will. Jesus, when he speaks about prophecy, knowledge in advance, he uses a word, signs. And what Jesus says is there will be visible signposts. Some of you, when you traveled to church today, you saw Larry Caldwell Drive. You saw a sign. You knew when to get off. Jesus says the events in the last days, they become signs. You know you're getting close. When I travel from Prescott Valley, it even gave the miles until the Larry Caldwell exit. If you're coming uh, west from Prescott Valley, the events that we are seeing take place in the world, they are visible signposts. Matthew 24, 33. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near, it is at the doors. We look at this. How could God predict something more than 2,500 years ago? Because he says, I am bringing time to a close. It's not going to keep on going like it is right now. Judgment is coming on the earth. The return of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, God who is in control, he knows that Russian rulers want conquest and power. He knows that Muslim rulers want death for Israel. And God says, I am going to use that to bring about my will. I believe that God is using Russian aggression to ultimately bring about revival. One of the things that's happening in the world, this is, of course, uh, quite new to us, that you can watch war in real time. It is very unsettling to people. And it's causing people to be open. When I went to... South Africa, I was on a shuttle going from one terminal to another, and the lady who was driving, she said to me, I don't know her, never met her before, she said, what do you think about what's happening in Ukraine with Russia? And it opened the door. I was able to witness and tell her exactly what was coming and tell her about Jesus Christ. Listen, this gives us motivation when you read the signs this gives motivation for God's people. You can't live like time is going to go on forever. It's not going to. People talk about this. What do you think? You think that Ukraine is going to somehow defeat Russia? I do not. Russia is going to conquer Ukraine. And the moment they're finished, I predict, then they'll start moving on the other one. I hate to say this, we have churches in Moldova. Moldova is next. Moldova has an awesome army of 6,000 men. That's it. There's 10,000 Russians on the border right now versus 6,000 Moldova. They're going to keep on taking over nations until finally they believe the time is right to attack Israel. The Bible calls the days in which we live the last days. The clock is winding down. And uh, God is, is not just going to judge. Please, any of my Russian friends who are watching this, this is not anti-Russian, this sermon. The judgment that is coming on Russia, all it means is their judgment is going to come a little bit sooner than the rest of the world's. But the whole world is going to be judged. The Bible speaks about this, a seven-year period in which God's judgment is poured out. By the end of it, uh, uh, some three-quarters of the world's population will be killed. We, we read about this. This is terrible. Uh, you know, 29 people were killed in this bombing and, uh, you know, hundreds there. You can't get your head around it. We're talking billions because God says, I am not going to let time keep going. I'm not going to let sin keep going. I am going to judge the whole world. But listen, there is hope for believers. Do you know why that thought of judgment on the world does not depress me? Because I'm not going to be here. The Bible says the hope for every believer is something called the rapture. The disappearance, instant disappearance of every believer God will remove them from the earth so that he can judge the earth. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in Latin, repeal, disappear together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. Listen, time is coming. God is going to unleash that seven-year period, but before that happens, every true believer, and I, I, I didn't say, do you name the name Christian? Do you come to church once in a while? True believers, God knows the heart. He says in a moment of time, every true believer will be caught up. That's what we call the rapture. Then the way is clear for judgment to come on the earth. I, I want to speak to our Russian friends. We have numbers of churches in Russia, no doubt. Pastor Sergei will see this. Other ones that can speak English or perhaps they'll translate this. I want to tell you God loves the Russian people. He's going to judge the Russian leaders. He's going to judge the nation, unfortunately, because of the decisions of leaders. But God loves the Russian people. What's very interesting is prophecies that have been spoken about Russia in a good way. Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was not a Pentecostal. Hudson Taylor, the famous missionary to China, he was on a ministry furlough back in England. He was preaching in a church and suddenly he stopped and for some time he just stopped saying nothing with his eyes closed and finally when he opened his eyes he said, I've seen a vision. I saw in this vision a great war that will encompass the whole world. I saw this war recess and then start again, actually being two wars. After this, I saw much unrest and revolts that will affect many nations. I saw in some places spiritual awakenings. In Russia, I saw that there will come a general, all-encompassing national spiritual awakening so great there could never be another like it. From Russia... I saw the awakening spread to many European nations, and then I saw an all-out awakening followed by the coming of Jesus Christ. I believe that to be true. Amen. That is good news. And it is well possible that God could use the unrest and the hardships of war to cause the Russian people to be open to the gospel and turn to him. You know, you can read in the news, of course, not all the Russian people are happy about this war. Listen to this, Lester Summerall, a famous Pentecostal preacher, he prophesied about Russia. He said the doors for outside help will be closed and my people will rely only on my help. My spirit will guide them when there seems to be no way as I will provide my church with everything it needs to get through these days I will bring to this earth. And I'm already preparing the hearts of the people for the coming harvest. It will come through my visitation, which will shake the gates of hell. And then I will open the doors of this country, not for many to come here as it was before, but to release this fire from this country throughout the earth. And many of them will take this fire and carry it all over the world. I was speaking to our pastor, Sergei Golubev, the leader of our churches in Russia. He says they've been placed in a state of war. Part of the state of war is that young Russian men will now be drafted in to the army. But anything the devil uses to try to ruin, God uses to work his will. So now think about this. Vladimir Putin is going to call Russian men. Many of them are believers who've been saved in our churches. And they're going to be sown like seeds into the Russian military. And they have the answer. They're going to be able to tell of Jesus Christ. So I say to the Russian people, God needs you to trust him. He needs you to stand strong. But for all of us, especially those that are watching here, some of you may be watching online, God wants us to see the signs and act on the information. What I read for you is not just idle interest, like, cool. That is not why God writes it. He writes it so we will act upon it. You know, the problem is whenever signs come, some people pay attention and live, and others ignore the signs 
and they die. In 1969, in Mississippi, Hurricane Camille was headed for the shore. A group of people, they thought, how cool will it be to have a hurricane party? And so instead of what they were being told to do, run, leave, they went to some apartments just 250 feet from the surf and they started partying. Chief Jerry Peralta came to warn them, you need to leave, there's a hurricane coming. They laughed and they said, you'd have to arrest us to get us to leave. So he said, at least give me your name so I can notify your next of kin. Sure enough, Hurricane Camille hit with winds of more than 205 miles an hour. The waves crested between 22 and 28 feet high. All 20 of those people partying, ignoring the signs, they died. That is just a little picture of what happens every time God gives us the signs. There will be people knowing that time is coming to the end. They are going to keep on living the way they have and their end will be destruction. There are no doubt, I'd love to believe everyone here is a Christian. I'm not that foolish. There are people here, you're going, yeah, yeah, but I'm young. I am telling you, if you ignore the signs, the end will be destruction. But on the other hand, for every person here, Number one, if you're not right with God, you don't want to face the judgment of God that is coming, not being right with God. You can fix that problem because Jesus died for your sins. You can go free. And number two, for every believer, I tell you, time is running out. You can see all of the signs lining up. God deliberately lets us see that in advance so we can make right decisions. Now is the time to live pure lives. Now is the time to tell people the end is coming. Jesus is coming back. We need to be ready for the rise and the fall of the bear. I want you to bow your heads all across this place. Thank God. I appreciate your attention. I know that I preached longer than I normally do, had a lot to cover, but there are people that are here. I bring you face to face with a decision. You can see it, you can see the signs, but will you heed the warnings? What are you going to do about your sin? Are you going to continue in sin and face the judgment of God, or are you going to turn from your sin and let God save you? I am telling you there is good news in Jesus Christ. God does not want you to be judged on this earth. He does not want you to be judged in hell. And he made a way. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He paid for our sin. We are the ones who deserve punishment. And yet he was punished in our place. You could pray and turn from your sin. And all that is coming in the world, you don't have to be a part of that because God will save his people. How many people are here right now while our heads are bowed? If you are not right with God, then my challenge for you is do you want to pray? You say, Pastor Greg, I know that I am not right with God. You want to turn from your